Okay, so I'm on an overpass just south of Boston, and that is a zipper truck. It shuffles concrete barriers twice a day to create an extra lane for rush hour traffic. But traffic is still here. Why can't we solve rush hour? The average American spends about 40 hours a year stuck in traffic. And these additional highway lanes, HOV lanes, ramp meters, express lanes, and tolls are some of the most common traffic solutions found on US freeways. But after driving all over the Bay Area with the transportation engineer, I learned that a lot of these traffic solutions can actually make rush hour worse, not better. Okay, before we can start with solutions, we have to get to the root of the problem. The reason we have this starts with this. So in the 1800s, people started working long days in new factories. It was the Industrial Revolution. But at least their commutes weren't so bad. Most people walked, or by the early 20th century, took a streetcar or one of these omnibuses. And all the time people wanted shorter work days. Eight hours became a rallying cry. It even became a big campaign issue in the 1912 presidential campaign. And then in 1914, this guy instituted an eight hour workday for his workers while also doubling worker pay. His competitors were like, what are you doing, man? But Ford's profits doubled and others started to see the eight hour workday as a win-win for everybody. The higher wage also meant workers could begin to afford automobiles. And so car culture begins. So this guy didn't just help make cars popular, he made the nine to five the norm. I guess he's like kind of our villain here. Because once factory workers started to work a nine to five, a whole lot of other people did too. Not just punching in hours at the factory, but pushing papers at the office or manning the till at the shop. And so by the time Dolly Parton starts singing working nine to five, more Americans are living in the suburbs, buying cars and driving to and from work. Today, roughly 92% of Americans have access to at least one car. And here's the thing. Over the decades, we built so many highways and roads and interstates just to get us places in cars. And it never quite seems to be enough. We always need more lanes, more highways, more interchanges, and more solutions. Making roads wider seems like a no-brainer solution to rush hour. Too many cars? Add more lanes. So this is the Marin Sonoma Narrows project. There's many things being done on this project, but the main thing is that they are widening the road to yes. add an additional lane. This is Byron Tang, Principal Transportation Engineer for the City of Hayward, California. My name is Byron, and I'm a traffic engineer. The key word here is narrows. Caltrans is widening this 52-mile stretch of highway along Marin and Sonoma counties because there's just been so much traffic here where three lanes bottleneck into a narrow two. So they're hoping to free things up to get cars flowing. So one thing about widening road is it's, it's very expensive. This project alone has already taken over 13 years and $762 million. And it's not done. When it is finally finished, studies indicate road widening like this can reduce congestion and increase travel times really well in the short run. However, if you increase the capacity of the road, you allow for more cars to use it. And if there is demand there, they just see more cars and it eventually ends up being congested again. Induce demand. Basically, if you make it, they will come. Transportation models suggest that over time, say 10, 20, 30 years, that new space will get filled with more cars. And before you know it, you're back, stuck in gridlock. More supply of something, in this case additional highway lanes at no additional cost, means they're going to use it. Meet Chris. He's an economist at Washington State University and a fellow Dynamo host. And it's not just roads. Take free napkin dispensers. There's the initial demand the restaurant provides one napkin with a meal, and every now and then a customer comes back to the counter to ask for more napkins. To solve this, the restaurant supplies a whole dispenser next to the ketchup. Now, we're gonna see induced demand. You can grab a whole stack. Use one to wipe your mouth, one to blow your nose, one to write your great startup idea on. Free napkins aren't just meeting existing demand. They're actually creating new demand. So that's why uh, there are other things that we try to do, like um, ramp metering. To merge onto most freeways in the Bay and in many major US cities, drivers run into ramp meters, stoplights that tell cars when they can and can't enter. They were first deployed in the 1960s in Chicago on the Eisenhower Expressway to help reduce congestion by regulating the rate at which cars enter the freeway. 
It makes sense. It's why we wait in line and crumble instead of shoving ourselves en masse into crowded spaces. Okay, so this is a ramp meter. Um, we're at an on-ramp to the US 101 freeway. Okay. And if this was on, it would stop cars here at this stop bar, and it would prevent them from entering the freeway quickly and all at once. When the Bay Area put ramp meters on for the first time many decades ago, they got about 30% reduction in some travel times oh, wow. on some freeways. Yeah, wow. so it, it was very effective. But the problem is more people move here. You know, there's a lot of population growth, so still things get congested, right? Things get yeah. congested, yeah. Which, in the long run, sounds to me a lot like the handiwork of our favorite nemesis after Henry Ford. Induced demand. While there's limited data on ramp metering and induced demand, because it's really hard to design a study that isolates induced traffic in the long run, it still seems like the fundamental law of highway congestion applies. If ramp meters make it easier for cars to travel faster on the highway by regulating the rate at which cars enter and freeing up space on the road, then maybe other drivers will be like, hey, I'll try too. And then we're back to where we started with congestion. So we're going up to the bridge right now, and we're doing that because there are two things I really want to see, which is the zipper truck, and I want to see what it makes, which is an HOV link. Because this thing is cool. It works by picking up concrete and steel barriers and shifting them over to create a new lane for the direction that has the most traffic. Much better than how they used to do it. So on the Golden Gate Bridge, rush hour traffic coming from the north side into San Francisco during the weekday will have four lanes instead of the standard three. If you see in the middle, uh, there's a barrier and that's, that's what the zipper truck actually moves. So just like the road widening, it encourages use of cars. And another thing, when these zipper trucks create a new lane, they're usually high-occupancy vehicle lanes. In the U.S., HOV lanes were first implemented in Virginia in 1969. They're special lanes for just vehicles with two or more occupants. They're supposed to encourage carpooling, thereby decreasing the number of cars on the road. There's also a funny paradox. There's really only an incentive to drive in a special HOV lane if there's a lot of traffic and you want a lane to go faster in. If there's not a lot of traffic, then you might as well just drive in any of the other lanes. Then the HOV lane is, well, empty and unused. Similar to ramp metering, researchers have tried to study the trade-offs between the benefits of HOV lanes and the induced demand effect it could incur. Studies suggest that while HOV lanes likely reduce the total amount of congestion in the short run, in the long run, they might increase congestion. Yes, look who's back. So far, we've talked about a bunch of supposed traffic solutions that have to deal with supply. In this case, the amount of road. But what if we address demand? Well, California has an idea for that too. To the left of the freeway is one lane, and we call that express lane or a hot lane, which is high occupancy toll lane. Okay. And what is there is if, if you're driving that lane, um, there's a sign that tells you how much toll that you have to pay to be in that lane. If you want to go faster, you can pay to go faster. California was the first state to implement HOT lanes or hot lanes as one way of controlling the flow of traffic on the roads. The toll changes depending on the time of day and the amount of congestion in the freeway. As you might expect, it's often much higher during rush hour. I've seen it get as high as like $10, $15 around in that range just to Whoa. get to um, one segment of the freeway and then like, um, like a couple miles ahead. How it works is they have these sensors that sense your vehicle. This, um, Do you just bring that out or, with you? Yeah, I carry it wherever I am. <laughs> Do you feel like it helps or hurts rush hour traffic? Um, it helps for the people who are in it, who pay for it. Right. Um, but in terms of like uh, rush hour traffic, the freeway is often still congested. Like the other three or four lanes are often very congested. Wait, there's actually something important here. Do you use the express lanes? I do. <laughs> and um, only only in, in, in situations where I do need to use it. How high? Would you pay? I'll pay $15. Would you pay 20 Maybe. 30 No. No. All driving is an economic decision. That's right. That is very, uh, business explains the world. <laughs> it's controlled by basically economics, right? Like supply and demand, um, the price right. is what controls it. And that's kind of the only real way to control traffic on like the demand side. Um, so for example, 
Um, Singapore uh, was the first to do congestion pricing. Ah, yes, congestion pricing. After Singapore started charging drivers a fee for driving in certain areas during peak hours, traffic was reduced by almost 20% in the designated zones. Congestion pricing is still working in Stockholm after 19 years. In London, it worked for over a decade, but by 2016, it was reported that traffic was back to original levels. Now, New York City is trying it. Early data show that travel times in the congestion zone are down 8%. So right now, we don't have anything like that here in the in the Bay Area. Yeah. What about the Bay's public transit system? Do you think that if you implement congestion pricing, then you have to have an adequate alternative, right? Exactly, and that's something um, this region is trying to invest in. And you definitely do need that because you're basically, you would be raising the price of driving, which means um, you might price some people out if they don't have an alternative. Like for example, public transit is affordable, but can people um, reach that? Right, like, uh, yeah. Close enough yeah. to be able to take that. But if we solve that, we need a lot less space for vehicles. Think about how much space a car takes up versus a bus. A typical bus is about three times the length of a typical car but the bus can hold as many as 60 people. Congestion at its like most basic level occurs when there's a mismatch between the road supply and the demand. Think about it. We all respond to incentives. Adding more space on the road without increasing the cost for drivers is an open invitation to drive more. But charge more money to drive on that road and people start to consider other options. A lot of private companies have figured this out. Love it or hate it, Uber's surge pricing provides an incentive to get more cars on the road. Or, according to one study, at least gets existing cars to go where the demand is. So if we're not going to ditch the 9 to 5, and increasing the amount of space on the road might not work in the long run, then perhaps the best way for us to solve rush hour is to make driving a lot more expensive and provide a bunch of other options for people for how they get to work. Even if it makes them unhappy and takes a long time, the real solution might be the hardest solution because it doesn't seem like we're gonna go back to walking to the factory anytime soon.